Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 403, 503 with yours truly, Dr. Matt Barton. And uh, in this lecture, we'll be diving into this chapter of uh, Writing Spaces, Volume 3, called in, in, An Introduction to and, and and Probably should only have one and. An Introduction to. Why does that have two ands? I, I will never know. Uh, anyway, An Introduction to and Strategies for Multimodal Composing, I think, should be the. Uh, proper title there. I think it's worth pointing out that the article itself is actually licensed with a Creative Commons license. You can see attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. So a bit of legalese there, but it's actually a good thing because uh, what this does is unlike cop regular copyright where you'd have to get the permission, you know, explicit uh, permission of the copyright holder, to legally be, you know, just putting this on a website, for example, or sending it to students to, for their, uh, you know, learning enjoyment, shall we say. Uh, it's, you don't have to get permission because it's kind of granted as part of this Creative Commons license. And the, the stipulations, though, there are some, some red tape, if you will. Uh, attribution means that you have to say, you can't just say this is mine or take her name off and just put it somewhere. You have to say, yes, this was from... Uh, Melanie uh, Gadgic, which, you know, makes sense. You know, she did the work. She wants credit. I don't blame her for that. Uh, Non-commercial means you can't turn around and sell this. You know, you got it for free, so if you put it on your website, you can't charge people to look at it. Uh, the no derivatives means you can't, I guess, uh, you know, take this and try to use it as the basis for some, some other project. You know, she won't allow that. Uh, you need to get her permission to do that. Uh, but... The, on the positive note, again, you could put this, you could spread this, you could email it to people, I could put it on D2L, I don't have to get anybody's permission for that project. And the reason I bring all this up is she will, later on in this essay, she talks about where to get some of these resources that you might want to use, especially if you're doing a multimodal project. You might not be a musician, for example, but, but you want a little piece of a song, <laughs> or you might want a little piece of a video, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, this Creative Commons licensing uh, will let you do that you can find things you can you're free to use you can remix it uh, however you want in these multimodal projects but anyway we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves uh, so sh this article will be about first of all what is what the heck is multimodal composing what is that why should you care about it and then assuming that you do care and you're convinced by the argument which hopefully you will <laughs> you probably already are <laughs> You're taking this class. I mean, surely you like this stuff. Uh, but she will give you some some basic strategies, which I think are really cool, because her, the, her strategies, these pre-drafting strategies she's talking about here, uh, I think these would work really well. It's, if it's a YouTube video, if it's a, a game project, you know, it's it's pretty uh, it's broad enough to accommodate basically any kind of multimodal project. Uh, okay, so let's dive into it. And she says here that, I think I'm looking at the overview. Let's skip down to where she defines. Yes, what is a multimodal text? <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not crazy about that term, multimodal. You know, for never, I don't really like the term mode, to be honest with you. I always think about a, a commode. <laughs> not the image I want, but I guess I didn't want to use multimedia. And there's multiliteracy. And I got all these different words. Uh, for basically the same stuff, you know, it used to be called new media, and then, yeah, you know, we've been over all the different terms. Uh, Doug Iman talks about this as well, uh, but maybe this one's okay. Uh, she cites uh, here. This is Gadget citing Takeyoshi and Pamela Takeyoshi and Cynthia. I'm going to call her Cindy because that's what she goes by. But Cynthia L. Self, kind of the uh, you know really big important. <laughs> <laughs> names, <laughs> uh, huge uh, pioneers, just really, uh, you know, people you ought to know if you're in this uh, discourse community. Uh, anyway, they have a term for what they call multimodal text, and they define it as text, texts that exceed the alphabetical and may include still and moving images, so basically pictures, graphs, that sort of thing, uh, animators, I'm not sure why it's not animations, but <laughs> you know what they mean. Uh, color, words. You know, it's interesting how words is 
is in there. Uh, music and sound. Uh, so you could think, well, what is not multimodal? And, and you know, the gadgets, uh, gadgets credit here, she does talk about how even an academic essay, you know, even if it looks like, you might think, well, that's just nothing but words. But when you really think about it, and you start seeing, well, there's a little bit of design here. There's a little bit of the visual uh, in the way paragraphs are laid out on the page. And as a matter of fact, one of the uh, my, one of my revision strategies, one of my editing strategies, is to actually to zoom out on a document to the point where you might be too small to see the words. But I'm not looking for the words. Uh, what I'm looking at is like the shape of the paragraphs, right? Make sure they're not too long. Just make sure it kind of looks nice visually. Uh, and believe it or not, that can actually make for a better uh, essay. And it, <laughs> it prevents me from writing these, you know, two or three page long paragraphs that uh, put you to sleep before you even read the first sentence. Uh, okay, back to this. Um, she says, uh, creating a multimodal text does not require the use of a digital tool. It does not need to be in an online space. Uh, so she says that a multimodal project, yeah, it could be a website, could be a game, like Cindy uh, Self talked about there and Takayoshi. could be something with a lot of colors and music and all that, but it could be uh, some, basically any two things. Right? So she talks here about a collage. I don't know if you've ever done one of these. They're kind of fun. I used to have it as a class project in <laughs> my 191 class. Uh, but you might say uh, the way I would use it, you know, I'd say, right, you know, write an argumentative essay, ethical perspective on something uh, as an essay, but then also make a collage and you can cut, you know, get scissors of paper and some newspapers or magazines. Like, you know, just get down there and like cut out some pictures and get some glue, <laughs> you know, just to make this thing on a piece of poster board. Man, the students just love that. Uh, it was just fun, you know, frankly, to, to do something like that. It's kind of artistic. Uh, but she says that's a, to her, hey, that's a multimodal text, right? It's got the, the features there. Uh, you're using those existing printed artifacts. I mean, you didn't go out and take the pictures. Uh, you're cutting them out of a magazine. Uh, but there's still quite a bit of composition taking place there, right? There's creativity in, like, the, the images that you select. You know, you're not just randomly picking images, uh, for one thing. Uh, and you also are being creative in the way that you put them on the you know, the places that you glue them, the stuff you put them next to, next to and so on. Uh, and it's, it's kind of hard to describe it just in words. But, I mean, if you if you have ever made a collage or looked at some collages, you know, some are better than others. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily be a graphics designer or a professional artist to, uh, to see that, yeah, that one is really good. You know, it's really effective. I see what that has to do with your argument. You know, it's uh, it's striking. It's poignant. Uh, that other one looks just like a bunch of random, you know, random images. Uh, but anyway, uh, that to her is multimodal because it's using those different modalities. Um, and I wanted to show you this one. Let me get out of this for a second and show you something interesting. <laughs> the Ballad of the Internet Nutball. Uh, chaining rhetorical visions from the margins of the margins <laughs> to the mainstream in the Xenoverse. Now, I like this because I just think Xena is fantastic. <laughs> uh, apparently, you know, uh, Bozy, Christine um, Bose, or Bozy, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her name, does too. Uh, this is 1998, and this was a PhD dissertation. You probably know that to get a you know, if you're a graduate student, you know this, but uh, if you're undergrad, you might not realize that to actually get a PhD or to get a master's degree, uh, you have to write a fairly lengthy document. It's called a thesis in the case of the master's program. It's called a dissertation uh, when you get to the PhD level. And it's basically a book, as the way this is traditionally thought of, and takes, a, you know, anywhere from a, at least a semester. You know, it usually takes a year sometimes many, many years to make these things. And tr traditionally, they're printed and bound and put in a, you know, library somewhere and, you, you know, uh, in a kind of expensive printing process. But around uh, the late 90s, as you can see here, there was this 
possibility. Hey, uh, maybe instead of a traditional printed thing with no pictures, you know, maybe a graph if you're lucky. You know, Christine uh, Bozy's like, why don't, you know, since I'm talking about Xena, and by the way, folks, if you haven't, if you're interested in rhetoric of pop culture, uh, this one, this dissertation is great. Because she uses the, uh, what's it called, the uh, Fisher, <laughs> uh, fantasy theme analysis, there we go, uh, to rhetorically analyze the, not just Xena, but the fandom around Xena and all this stuff around the, what she calls it, the Xenaverse, sort of the fandom uh, of the, the fan communities around Xena. So she she goes into all kinds of detail here, but it's a pretty good example of what you can do with that theory, the uh, SCAFTA you know, analysis. If you took 306 with me, <laughs> uh, lucky you, you know, it's one of those chapters. Uh, but anyway, uh, her argument is, you know, I'm looking at Xena, There's, this is a television show, and I want to bring in this all this fan stuff, so it doesn't make much sense to me. This is Christine telling, <laughs> talking here. So you can't see that page, I guess, but what happened? Go back. Uh, so she wanted to do a, uh, a, a dissertation that had hypertext. So you see she's got features here, like you can see that, oh, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> you know, I always do that. You know, I find like the one link uh, well, there's a couple. <laughs> it, makes, it looks like I'm trying to make somebody look bad. Uh, but anyway, uh, she has all kinds of pictures in here. She's got what she calls data sectors. There's a lot of uh, images. There's video clips in this. And as you can see, there's these links that take you to different parts of the... There's a little window that pops up here on the side. Let me... See if I can add that to the screen so you can see what I'm looking at. And so these little pop-ups that happen occasionally. Uh, so these are like little bits of uh, messages that she's received. And she's also got... Go away now. <laughs> uh, she's also got uh, places where you can comment on these pages. And like, I don't know if she still maintains this or not. Uh, uh, but it was pretty cool that you could, like, talk to the author, ask her questions, and some of her committee members were doing that. But anyway, there's a project, and I think she makes a pretty good case in there. I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> it's a dissert literally a dissertation. <laughs> uh, but she makes an argument. Yeah, I need to have more than just words to talk about this. I've got to have the pictures. I want to have this interaction, you know, with the uh, people reading it. You know, that's part of it. I want to have video clips and, and sounds. You know, uh, Xena, for example, she's got that battle cry. You know, you, how do you represent that battle cry in writing? I mean, you could spell it out, a bunch of A's and I's and E's, I guess, but that's not nearly as good as being able to hear it. And since it's online, why not just put a little sound clip? You know, a little, little sound thing there. You can play the, and hear the sound. Uh, that's basically her, her argument. I think you'll agree that makes perfect sense. You know, why are we still working just strictly with print, uh, especially if you're studying something like Xena, uh, when you have access to all of these other uh, modalities uh, that you could use to help analyze and, and, and show people uh, what it is you're talking about. Okay, so that's the basic argument. And then she talks about these different modes, and this is from the New London Group. And I also have a picture. <laughs> yes. And this one is also licensed by the Creative Commons. But if you look at this, what is this called? A pie chart, I guess, or kind of a diagram. I, I don't know. I'd have to refresh my memory on that. But you can see how they've got linguistics, linguistic design having to do with language, words, all right, writing or spoken. Uh, then you've got visual design, gestural design. I love this because everybody forgets about the importance of body language. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's fun to study. And so I love that they've got that in there. Uh, then they got spatial design. You know, how things are laid out on a page. Uh, and then audio design, uh, music, sound effects, etc. So the 
again, you probably think first and foremost, in English class, you naturally gravitate towards the linguistic design, all the stuff we've been talking about with the rhetoric, uh, but not so much this other stuff, right? You might think, well, visual design, that's for artists, you know, that's for an art class, graphics design class, and, you know, sure, uh, you know, but the fact is, they're just stuff that everybody needs to know, some basics, you know, about how to design uh, with those elements, you know, to be rhetorically effective, right? You got all available means of persuasion. Uh, if you can use colors somehow to make a point, you know, why, why not? Why would you want to restrict yourself from that? Uh, same thing with gestures and all these elements. Uh, so these are the new, the new London group. And their argument was that, you know, just as you want students, you know, children or young adults or adults, uh, anybody really, uh, if the goal is to make them, you know, more effective and as leaders or communicators or whatever the case may be, more literate, uh, you should try to teach these other things too because it's not, and you know, nobody's just born uh, with this knowledge. I mean, nobody is born born <laughs> knowing how to read and write. <laughs> you know, this this has to be taught. Yeah, there's certain things you could pick up on, but, you know, the argument is if you, you know, are systematic about teaching these things, you can really help people out, and this stuff that people need to know. Uh, so the visual mode, things you can see, moving the still images, colors, uh, even a font selection, So there's a picture of the dog there. <laughs> Linguistic mode refers to alphabetic text or spoken word. You know, and I would add here, I don't know if they put it in gestures. Or when we get to gestures, we'll see there. But I always uh, like to put sign language in the same category. You know, so you've got uh, speaking, writing, and, and signing. You know, I put those on the same level because uh, they're very... You know, it just makes sense to me to do that. Uh, so that's the linguistic mode they're talking about. And you can see this. She uses this example here of a, uh, I guess, a website a brochure. Not sure what this is. is that a Pinterest? <laughs> uh, but you can see it's mostly words. The the spatial mode is an interesting one. It refers to how a text deals with space, how other modes are arranged, organized, emphasized, and contrasted. And then she's got this picture here where the uh, they're using uh, these spatial relationships or, or visuals. Uh, so like this, this, the size of that circle around lung and breast and stomach. What is this, cancers? Yeah, new cancer cases. So they make the circle bigger to kind of give you this, you know, I guess what you call a spatial emphasis. So that takes up more space. Uh, that circle's bigger, takes up more space, so it kind of makes you think, oh, that must be a more, you know, it's more important. It's, there's more people with that. <laughs> it kind of reinforces that, that message. And so she calls that the, the spatial mode. Uh, and you could do the same thing. You know, I wrote a paper one time looking at uh, different churches and the way these, you know, <laughs> I won't get into, into too much here, but there's a lot of different kinds of churches. Uh, they're built very differently. Now, there's different size churches, and there's, there's a lot of stuff you can talk about there. And I was I looked at it, I was interested in that from a rhetorical, you know, perspective. Like, yeah, you're talking about a building, pretty far removed from from a speech. Uh, but I argued there that you know there's certain ways you can lay things out to where, you know, if you think about a lecture hall, uh, where you've got all the seats kind of like this, and then you got the the big podium in the middle. You know, it really kind of makes that speaker. You know, just by the spatial arrangement of the room, you know, really makes that speaker seem like they're the important person, literally like the focus. <laughs> so it's it's like a, it's a weird thing, but it's it's kind of a rhetorical, you know, it's almost like rhetorical architecture, you know, a room design, uh, if you will. Uh, and then the you know, gestural mode. So what are they talking about? Their hands. The speakers move their hands and fix their facial features and other texts that capture movement. I'm talking about these, uh, yeah, little, little body language gestures. Now, see, I would again though, I would say this is different than signing, <laughs> sign language. You know, we're talking here about like rhetorical, like flourishes. You know, uh, moving your hands in a certain way, not as a substitute, or not 
it's not a language in and of itself, I guess. It's kind of a way just to uh, reinforce what you're saying with your hand movements. I wonder where dancing would fit into this. <laughs> uh, and then the oral, oral mode refers to what members can and cannot hear. So she talks about music there, podcasts. Well, you see, this is, you couldn't say speaking because they've already covered that with that linguistic category. But, of course, as you can imagine, you know, you can't just have a nice little chart. No, because everything is kind of bleeding. It's not, it's never mutually exclusive. You know, things are, well, does it make sense to talk about spatial, not be talking about visual? Uh, can you have anything that's just purely one item on that chart? You know, that would be a wonderful world. <laughs> or maybe it would be hell. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, she says, no, no, no. Look, even an essay that you write, you could try to be traditional as you want. Five paragraphs, you know, you name it. Uh, you could even use in today's society in there somewhere. Uh, but there's still going to be all three of these, at least three modes. Linguistic, obvious. Uh, but we talked about the spatial arrangement and the visual yeah, the visual mode includes elements like the font, font size, use of bold. Now, you could be one of those people that tries to italicize everything. Oh, please don't be one of those people. Uh, but that, even in this traditional essay, we've got all three of those modes. You kind of wonder, does it even make sense to try to, <laughs> to distinguish them? Why even bother? Well, she says, and I would agree with this, it makes sense because some... You know, it's like with ethos, logos, and pathos. To take this all the way back to Aristotle. Yeah, it's kind of hard to find something and just say, look, that is just purely ethos. You know, it's rare. But it is easier to find cases where you're like, that is the majority of that appeal is ethos. Or the pathos there really stands out. I mean, you know, look at, look at how angry that speaker looks. There's a lot of pathos uh, in that. So you're not saying that there's no logo so that there's no ethos it's just that that one uh, appeal really stands out and he, same thing here we're just saying that there could be a, a document or a text i suppose where there's a strong visual component versus a strong oral component and, you know you get the idea uh, so that brings us to the question of should students be learning these things in the classroom you know is it isn't it hard enough and there's all these, there's a sort of infamous or famous, whichever you choose, I go back and forth, uh, article called Why Johnny Can't Write. Or it was Why Johnny Can't Read, I think. And then there was another one about he can't write. Johnny can't do much. <laughs> you, know, you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, the teachers aren't teaching the stuff that the students really need to know, right? You can kind of get distracted. You know, if I'm having students in 191 do all these collages, for example, you say, look, that's time that could have been spent talking about transitions and coordinating conjunctions, and you haven't really covered the who and the whom, <laughs> you know, and the works cited pages. You know, you've only got so many hours in a day. <laughs> you can't have a class, <laughs> you know, that's uh, 25 hours a day long. Thank God. Um, uh so, I, you know, I sympathize to some extent with that argument, though, that, uh, you know, I always joke that, well, if all you learn in, a, in an English class was how to write a damn good five-paragraph essay, I mean, that, that's no small achievement. Uh, most people can't do that. <laughs> it's, it's really actually pretty impressive if you can uh, do that really well. Um, so um, that, I, I agree with that on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, though, you know, for one thing, you know, we don't live in a world that's just purely text. And I, I would agree to a large extent that, yeah, it's really helpful to at least have some basic knowledge of these other modalities. And you can't just ex always expect it to be happening in other classes or other places or just expect students just to, just to know these things. You know, I've often heard this argument that you don't really have to teach students things like social media because uh, they're already on it. They already know it. You know, they use it every day. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I find that there's still quite a bit of instruction. Or they can benefit in a lot of ways from uh, instruction on those. 
Uh, but anyway, you know, we'll probably never solve that that debate. Uh, let's see. Learning how to create a multimodal text will prepare you for the workforce by allowing you to embrace the skills you already have, or build on them, I would say, and learn how to target specific audiences for specific reasons using the various modes of communication. All right, so how do you create a multimodal text? And this is the part of the article I thought was really, really useful. Not that the rest of it's not. <laughs> uh, but I really love this bit. So this could be, again, you could be a podcast, a blog, a tweet, you know, anything. Uh, first, you know, what is the rhetorical situation? And we'll, we'll talk about each one of these here. So the first one, determine your rhetorical situation. Review and analyze other multimodal text. Key step. You know, this is imitation. This was a classic, part of that classical rhetorical training that practiced all the way through up into the Renaissance and beyond. Uh, gather content, media, and tools. Cite and attribute, cite and attribute information appropriately and then begin drafting. Uh, so we can look at these. She's got her breakdown here. Very, uh, I think Aristotle would approve or Bitzer. <laughs> and so what is the rhetorical situation that you're in? And she breaks this into a message, the purpose of the text, the content, uh, the audience, who's going to be looking at it, the author, you, you might not think about that as often as you should, uh, the genre and the medium. So the message, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, do you know, <laughs> and what is the thesis statement? You know, we used to ask about a, a paper. What is this about, you know? And sometimes you're not, even sure yourself. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. Like, I just had to write something, man. The deadline was, you know, next week. Uh, but you're not going to be very rhetorically effective. You, know, you need to be able to be succinctly, you know, you, you at least need to be clear on what is it you want to say. Uh, so she's got an example here. Uh, this is a clear message. Convincing college freshmen at my university to donate to the ASPCA. Uh, so you can see there, it's pretty clear what she's trying to persuade people to do. Donate to the SPCA. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> uh, the audience, uh, here she talks about two audiences, which I thought was kind of interesting. So you got the intended audience, which in her little example up here is these college freshmen. You know, that's who it's to, that's who it's addressed to. Uh, but you also have this uh, unintentional audience, which could be just people stumbling on to the site, like I was showing you that Xena dissertation. I mean, obviously that's for an academic audience, you know, most immediately her uh, dissertation committee, maybe other graduate students or, you know, scholars of Xena, <laughs> Xena scholars, <laughs> but it could just, maybe just a casual fan of Xena might want to look at it. Uh, maybe somebody that's just interested in electronic uh, dissertations might want to look at it. You know, so there's a lot of other people that might come across that page. So she just says it's good to have these two audiences in mind. Uh, the author, you should consider your relationship to the message and your audience. And she mentions here that you should think about your own biases. You might think about how, what other people might assume your biases to be. Uh, it could be another question we're pondering. Now, are you familiar, you know, what kind of relationship do you have to the readers? You know, this comes up a lot in my business writing and, and PCOM work. Because it's very different to be writing, <laughs> it's very different to, for a, uh, you know, to be writing to a manager from the position of an employee uh, than vice versa. Right? The audience and the author. There's, there's basically power dynamics at work there uh, that you want to keep in mind. Uh, you know, and to bring this to some multimodalities, you know, you can think about the differences in, you know, cartoons, for example, or animations on YouTube. When you make a, when you post a YouTube video, it asks you specifically, is this video meant for kids? You know, that's a question about audience. And the reason they ask that, obviously, is there's certain things that you, <laughs> they don't want kids to see. And you say, I never intended for kids to be looking at that. That's the checkbox. Yeah, it's, it's kind of forcing you to think about these unintended audiences. Uh, uh, the genre, she says, yeah, that's a tricky term. No kidding. <laughs> but it's a, a type of text. You might think about it as a category, genre. You know, it means 
I kind of think maybe like a genus, you know, same sort of word, uh, but a type. So a type of text, it has some conventions, expectations around it. So an example might be a resume. You know, everybody at some point will probably, well, I want to say everybody, but <laughs> probably most of you will have written or at least looked at a resume before. And, you know, it has certain things. You know, it's got contact info on it. It's got a work history on it. It's got an education section. And so you'd say that's the genre of resumes. So if you had, you have to, if you're writing a resume, you want to be familiar with what people expect to see. Otherwise, they would not recognize it as a resume. Uh, and then the medium, where will it be distributed? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be delivered on a Kindle? Uh, she, she even mentioned SoundCloud here. Uh, so all these different media or mediums, however you want to say that, have uh, features that you might want to consider. Like when uh, the Xenoverse, uh, you know, when Bozy was doing that Xenoverse dissertation, she had video clips. You know, she, she was trying to leverage the power of that medium. You know, the same thing with the Kindle. Uh, you want people to be able to search your text. You want to be using those, uh, you know, the features that it has, table of contents. God, what else does it have? You know, I've, I've seen some Kindle books that they're really not done very well. So, so like the table of contents doesn't work, <laughs> for example. Uh, so you really want to be uh, more aware of the medium than that. And try to take advantage of the bells and whistles that it offers. You know, what is the author's message? Who are they addressing? How can you tell? What type of text did they create? What are the conventions? Uh, this is how you analyze a multimodal text. Uh, so this might be useful for teachers as well to look at this list. You know, a student has turned in this multimodal composition of some sort, so you can be asking yourself these questions. Uh, how is the text distributed? How does it relate to the target audience? Do they even have a sense of the target audience? You know, some, sometimes people, <laughs> you know, they say, this is just written for everybody. I say, no, come on, you know, that, that doesn't work. You have to have a target audience in mind so you can tailor the message to them you got to have some intention behind uh, who you want to be reading this. Now, what modes of communication are they using? What do you like about the modal, modal text? What, in your opinion, needs work? Okay, and then she gets into how do you gather up the content, the media, the tools. Again, you don't necessarily need to be an artist and uh, open up Photoshop and go to town. And there's actually quite a bit of things you can take from other sources just like you might cite a, a a quote from a book you know same sort of thing you can take images as long as they are licensed and here's where she talks about this uh, the creative commons license exploring uh, open licenses now, so you can get on google and let me just show you this real quick Okay, let me show you this. So let's say I wanted to, I want a picture of a husky uh, dog in my PowerPoint, which I tend to do. Uh, so you could go to, you know how to use Google, and then you go to images, and you get all these pictures. Now here's the thing. If you just grab one of these pictures, it's probably copyrighted. It's probably illegal to use that. Now are they going to come and arrest you? Probably not. <laughs> But it's, you know, certainly if you were doing this commercially uh, or this for a thesis or something like that, you would certainly get into trouble just copying and pasting that in. So what you can do is you click on, let me just show you this again. So we go to images. And then there's this button over here called tools. Click on the tools button. This little thing pops up. Got some options there. Uh, say usage rights. And you see one of those is Creative Commons license. So I click on that. Now this, there's gonna be a lot fewer pictures, but these pictures, you know, I'll be able to use. And if we look at the license there, say, say, oh, I love this picture. You know, wouldn't that be great to use that in my PowerPoint? Yes. <laughs> but wait, you know, you wanna look at the license details and we can see what it does. Uh, copyright only dedication, copyright only dedication based on United States law or public domain certification. 
We retire this legal tool. Let's see. This is in the public domain. So the public domain. Wow. Okay, so if the public domain means that you don't have to do anything. You know, it's it's you could use this. You don't have to worry about citing anybody. Uh, that's probably not the best example. <laughs> you know, but most of these they at least want to. Uh... Oh come on, let me find one. There's one from Flickr. There we go. This will probably have the. Uh... Let's look at the license details. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so this one is not public domain. It's attribution, non-commercial, no derives. So it says you can share it, you can copy and redistribute the material in any medium or format, but you got some stipulations. You got to give the credit to the person. It says they want you to note to say where changes made, which makes sense. You know, if I take a picture, you know, if that were my picture of the dog and you took my picture and like cut part of it out or messed with the put a filter on it or something you know i wouldn't want people mistaking that for my brilliant masterpiece <laughs> so i say yeah this is a, this was originally matt barton's photo but i put a filter on it or whatever it says you can't sell it so you can't just print this out and put it on a t-shirt and be selling it at a, a flea market she says if you remix transform or build upon it you may not distribute the modified material. So that one's kind of strict. Uh, so this one you wouldn't, you know, if you, uh, she's basically saying, whoever this is, is saying if you did put those filters on it or you changed it up in some fashion, she says you can't share that or you can't publish it. So it's kind of just for your own. <laughs> you kind of enjoy it. You can send it to people, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but if you tried to use that as part of your project, uh, you need to get, uh, their permission to do that. Uh, okay, anyway, let's see if I can get back to my original. Now, you know, if you really want to be remixing, though, you can, there's ways you can get in there and specify, look, I only want to look for stuff that's the, uh, or that, I'll, yeah, you can say, I want to be able to remix it. So you could search in a way that, uh, I, this no deriv stuff, don't even show me that. <laughs> and I want to be able to sell it. Uh, so don't show me the non-commercial stuff. I mean, you can you can restrict it in those ways. And then she gives you some examples of tools you might use. And these change a lot. You know, she's got iMovie here, Windows Movie Maker. I don't even know if that's still around. Uh, there's all sorts of programs you can get. I don't even know if I, I think I'm pretty sure iMovie. They might call it something else now, but uh, that was a good one. Uh, hopefully that's still around. I don't know what the Windows one is called. Personally, I use uh, Vegas. Sony. Ve it used to be Sony Vegas. Now it's some other company. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can get through the school Adobe Premiere. You know, as part of that package of uh, Adobe products, and that's actually a really good deal. That's a really powerful one. Uh, I think the. I'm pretty sure that the video classes here might use Avid. Not 100 percent sure on that. You'd have to go talk to Mascom. Uh, but there's a lot, of, basically, a lot of options, and they go from really you sort of basically have to be professional to use all the way down to <laughs> really simple. <laughs> you sort of uh, pick it up and play with it. Sorts of video tools, and there's even like online things now where you don't even have to download programs to use it. But you definitely want to be looking at things. You know, if you want to make a podcast and you said, oh, let me make this podcast and you look at Final Cut Pro, you'd be, oh my God, I don't even know where to get started with this thing. Well, I'm just kind of, there are way too many buttons. <laughs> uh, but there's you know, so many programs between that, you know, uh, easier programs to use. Uh, you know, I use a Vegas, frankly, to do my podcast as well. I just kind of like the interface. But like the, the program I use to record these lectures is called... Uh, XSplit, I believe it's called. Yeah, XSplit Broadcaster. You know, it lets me do all kinds of fun stuff. You know, like, woo, yeah. <laughs> look how multimodal I am. <laughs> uh, lets you do fun stuff with this. Very easy to use. I mean, you know, if you see me using something, you know, it can't be that. You know, I'm not a professional. <laughs> I'm using it. Uh, let's see what else. I think that's about it for this article, right? Yeah, outlining or mapping your project. Very important with the multimodal project. 
you know, if you get into games, the games industry, for example, it's not like they're going to make a rough draft of a game. You know, it's way too expensive. Uh, so you have to map everything out on paper first, and then they, you know, any big decisions that have to be made, they make it at that stage, way before you know they start, you know, actually producing the assets. Uh, you got to make sure you got a pretty good plan before you move on. But anyway, we're about 40 minutes in. I think that's a good stopping point here, so I'll stop it. Hope you enjoyed this. And as always, let me know if you've got any questions or comments. Love to hear from you. Have a good day.